Whether it's through an elephant roar mixed with tires on wet pavement or the rumble of an air conditioning unit, Star Wars has continued to build on a landscape of sound that's been ingrained in our cultural consciousness for the last 40 years. With film, the goal of a traditional audio department is to reinterpret the visual environment into a complementary aural environment, giving realistic contextual sound to the images on screen. But what happens when none of those sounds exist? When there's no source to draw from? How do you convey the sound of light? Or speed in a vacuum? Well, that's the job of a sound designer. This sound designer, in fact, Ben Burt, the creator of the majority of the sound effects in the Star Wars library, which houses over 5,000 unique sounds and continues to grow with each new film. The term sound designer didn't really come into the filmmaking vernacular until Burt's work in 1977. Before then, film sound could be broken up into two different categories. The production mixer, which is this guy here in the pink booty shorts, whose job entails capturing on-set recordings of dialogue and background elements. And then there's the sound editors, who fabricate different sonic effects in studio or make creative enhancements to existing sound. That's the tradition of the division of labor in feature film, and it has been since the talkies of the 1920s. Since I was uh, an exception to that, traditional division of labor, I needed to describe myself in some new term. So I began to use the term sound designer, uh, which essentially meant that I, although I emphasized my creative work in sound effects, uh, my job was to coordinate all that you heard in the final soundtrack of the film. And only about 15% of the final mix of the first Star Wars is originally recorded audio. The rest was added in post with ADR and Foley. What are you at? I was about to learn. Now I am the master. Only a master of evil, God. The sound gives those visuals credibility and can take something that seemed relatively awkward during production and transform it into something epic. The sound and the score allow those moments to have weight, but some sequences rely on the sound alone to hold that emotion. A good chunk of the lightsaber duels are played without score, letting the rhythm of the sound design dictate the edit and create the cinematic atmosphere. And when the score resumes, the sound has to play against the music and the dialogue seamlessly. A fault in any of those three elements could ruin the entire mix. Vader's wheezing, for example, could have very easily become a major distraction. But instead of sounding like an asthma attack, they were able to turn a very unnatural sound into a natural characteristic of his voice by matching the low frequencies of James Earl Jones' delivery with breaths through a scuba tank regulator. And that simple effect gives more context to that character than any expository dialogue could. Some characters like R2-D2 are developed completely through sound. R2 has no dialogue or real physical action, yet he's able to have an entire spectrum of emotion just through beeps and boops. C-3PO has limb articulation, he's humanoid, and he has a human voice. Even BB-8 to a degree has different physical cues that you can attribute emotion to, like the lowering of the head, or the thumbs up. R2 is just a trash can on wheels, but we always know what he's feeling. And Bert was able to achieve that by combining his own voice, mimicking the sounds of an infant with a synthesizer, creating a performance that kept R2's language very abstract and robotic while maintaining a human element you can empathize with. That's what grounds these effects. Every sound has its roots in organic recordings rather than artificial ones. And that brings a familiarity to the unknown. The visual world of Star Wars is rusted and gritty and lived in, so every belt, gear, and exhaust used in the Foley helps sell that authenticity. It was essential that each sound be unique, making a clear association with the visual it originates from, especially in chaotic sequences like the attack run in the second Death Star. The Millennium Falcon, Star Destroyers, X-Wings, Y-Wings, A-Wings, TIE Fighters, and Explosions are all distinct and clear enough that you can locate them in the space of the frame even with your eyes closed. And that was important given the fact that most cinema audiences in the late 70s and early 80s would only experience the film through a single channel monural sound system. A six track 70 millimeter version as well as a Dolby stereo version of the mix were also on exhibition in the film's original release. But out of the 1750 theaters it screened in, only about 40 of them were equipped to handle anything other than the mono track. This was the 70s after all, and technology was pretty slow to roll out. But the incredibly dynamic mono mix of that first film was able to fool many audiences into thinking they were experiencing a much more advanced sound system than they actually were. And if we deconstruct some of these effects, we can see how that illusion was possible. The lightsaber, for example, is essentially just the hum of two harmonizing simplex projectors, interlock motors, and idle, along with the buzz of the transmission signal from a cathode ray tube television set. And the combination of those two sounds creates this which is the foundation of every lightsaber blade. And when played in a steady state condition through a speaker and recorded by a moving microphone, it creates a Doppler pitch effect. And that makes for a very authentic sense of movement and depth, even through a monural sound system. 
but we've come a long way since those early days, and the sound design is something that's only improved as the sagas progressed. Here's a list of the things many people, myself included, take issue with regarding the prequels. But the one thing I think we can all agree on is that this is absolutely incredible. There's a belief that good sound design is completely invisible, that Foley should only be perceived on a subconscious level, and that the sound should melt into the image as to not become a distraction. But I think that method of thinking stifles creativity. The sounds of Star Wars are just as iconic as the characters, vehicles, and weapons they give life to. And not every story warrants aural spectacle at the forefront, but film is in equal parts an audio-visual experience. And when the sound is relegated to playing second fiddle to the image, you're limiting an entire spectrum of artistic expression. I'd like to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this week's episode. Squarespace is a great all-in-one website building platform that offers easy-to-use tools with no patches, installs, or upgrades required. And with their award-winning 24-hour customer service and a great selection of designer templates to choose from, Squarespace is the perfect option for anyone wanting to build their brand online. Sign up today at squarespace.com captain to get 10% off your first order. That's squarespace.com slash K-A-P-T-A-I-N. <laughs>